Hello, good evening and welcome to Calvary Free Presbyterian Church in Muckerfeld, Northern Ireland. We do give you a warm welcome to Saviour's precious and worthy name and we do pray that you will enjoy this meeting tonight, not only enjoy it, but through it you will hear the voice of the Lord speaking to your soul. We're glad we're turning to the Word of God tonight. There's a message from the Lord and we are looking forward to hearing our brother minister in just a few moments' time. We're going to open up with a hymn, and it is, I had wandered far away in the land of mighty foes, and my soul had felt the bitterness of sin. I was marching with the hosts that the truth of God oppose, and among the saved I was not counted in. The last verse says, O my sinner friend, beware, a revealing day is near that will show the secrets of thy heart within. Have it cleansed by grace divine, and when Jesus shall appear, he will then among his jewels count you in. There's many things we can be involved in, many things we can put our name to, but the only thing that truly matters in life, in death, and in eternity is that you're counted in in the family of God, that you are saved by grace and washed in the blood and one of the redeemed. I trust and pray tonight, if you cannot say for sure that you're saved, that by the end of this meeting that you will have turned and called upon the Lord, and that promise is, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, then you will be counted in on that great day when the roll is called up yonder. Listen to the words of this hymn from a previous recording, Count It In. Let's stand and really sing it out. The Word of God is filled with Christ from Genesis right through to Revelation. We think of the Lord speaking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. 
and he opened on to them in uh, the Old Testament, the books of Moses and the prophets, and he showed them himself in the scripture. And there's a beautiful prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, and it speaks so clearly of our Savior as a substitute for sinners, the Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. And we read in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isn't that wonderful? With his stripes we are healed. Sinner can be healed tonight. That awful sickness of sin because of the work of Calvary. We're going to pray tonight that the Lord will work in the hearts of the unsaved and bring them to faith in the Saviour. Our gracious Lord and our loving eternal Heavenly Father, we thank Thee and we praise Thee tonight for this prophecy that we read in the book of Isaiah. We thank Thee, Lord. We know that this prophecy has been fulfilled in the work of our Saviour upon the cross of Calvary. Lord, he was wounded for our transgressions. Oh, he was bruised for our iniquities. What we deserved, he bore. The place that we deserved to be, he hung there. And we thank you, Lord, he bore it all because he loved a world of sinners lost, ruined by the fall. We thank thee, Lord, there is salvation offered tonight. We thank thee for the whosoever there is pardon and there is freedom and there is forgiveness through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lord, surely everyone who's been to Calvary for salvation can say amen tonight to that hymn. They can say we thank you, Lord, that we're under the blood tonight. We're washed and we're cleansed and we're brought nigh to God. And we praise you, Lord, that this is the doing and the work of thy hands. And we thank you, Lord, that it's a perfect work that has been done. We pray, Lord, for those who know nothing of our joy. Maybe they mock the things of God. They spurn the cross. They say it's not for them. They don't realize the importance of their soul or the necessity of the new birth. We pray, Lord, tonight that thou wilt bring the true realization upon their hearts that they need to prepare to meet their God. And there's one way that God has provided, one plan that God has given, the plan of redemption through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray, Lord, not only will people realize, but they'll be brought to a point where they'll be convicted of their sin, make people uncomfortable comfortable tonight as they sit and listen to this message. Make people tremble in the fact that they will stand before a holy God on the day of judgment. Make people be prepared and ready tonight to uh, make right for eternity. Oh Lord, this world's living as if it will never die. And the reality is we're only here for a short time, but eternity's forever. Oh Lord, write eternity upon the hearts of the hearer tonight. Cause them to realize that what choice they make now will determine where they are in eternity. Oh, forbid it that any would hear the gospel. Forbid it that any would sing these hymns and know the truths of God's word and yet be found in eternity in hell. Oh, Lord of mercy tonight. In wrath, remember mercy. Remember that man, that woman who for years has spurned thee. Remember the one who's rebelled against thee. Remember the one, Lord, who's cut thee out of their life completely. We pray tonight, Lord, that thou wilt break in. And we pray, O Lord, a miracle of grace will be done in that heart tonight. Turn homes upside down in Muckerfeld tonight across this province, across this world. We pray, Lord, for souls to be saved, Lord, as they listen in to these meetings. And we pray to this end that you'll take up our brother and use him. Lord, fill him with the Holy Ghost. May he know the power of God, the power they knew at Pentecost. May our brother know it tonight and give him liberty, Lord, every word. And we pray he'll know the Lord standing beside him tonight. And as the gospel net is cast out, we pray, O oh Lord, that there will be men and women, boys and girls brought in to the Savior. We thank thee for the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the meeting we have to proclaim it tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we can preach, Lord, even in the midst of this uh, pandemic. And we pray that much will be done for the cause of the kingdom of God, even through this week of gospel mission. 
member land tonight. We do pray, Lord, for homes that have been bereaved, even this day. Oh, Lord, we pray that you'll speak to hearts, Lord, even as they mourn the passing of loved ones. Pray for government, Lord. You've told us to pray for those in authority over us, and we do it obediently, Lord. We don't always agree with them, but we bring them before thee, and we pray, oh, Lord, you'll deal with our hearts. And, Lord, we thank that you can do miracles in the high place as well as in the ordinary heart. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll do a miracle tonight, even in those in authority over us. And we pray in the days that lie ahead that, oh, Lord, there will be a Holy Ghost revival sent to this land. We know it will start in the prayer meeting. We know it will start in the pew and then it will spill out onto the streets into the hearts of the unconverted. We pray, O Lord, that revival will visit this church, this denomination, this land once again because, Lord, we know that Jesus is the answer. Lord, it's not education. It's not money. It's not wealth. It's none of those things. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of redeeming grace. O Lord, bless us, we pray. Start the work tonight, we ask. And bless our dear brothers, he ministers. Go before us, we pray, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Well, we do want to welcome you once again. Thank you for joining with us. As we've said each evening, if you haven't yet shared this uh, program on Facebook, then do hit the share button now. And as you click that share button, just pray to the Lord right now that the Lord would use that share to reach others with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do also remind you that there's a booklet and CD free to those who would like it. And certainly if you would like to receive that, then please do message us by email or by private Facebook messenger on our church page. And we will send that out to you in the morning. Uh, if you're a believer, please do pray that souls will be saved. And even though uh, the mission will be over just a few days' time in the will of the Lord, these meetings will be up on Facebook, they'll be on Sermon Audio, and we do pray that the Lord will use them even days, weeks, months after the preaching, and even through that bare fruit, uh, through the faithful ministry of the Word of God. We do uh, look forward to welcoming our brother back on Sunday evening for the final night of this mission. And as we said before, we do look forward to the future and we'll be inviting him back again for another time of gospel mission and be able to invite you to sit in these pews uh, in the near future in the will of the Lord. Just one more uh, song before uh, we hand over to your brother for the rest of the meeting. And there's no better theme to sing about or to use in the praise of the Lord than the theme of the cross. And this hymn from our choir just from Easter a couple of years ago is when I survey the wondrous cross. And praise the Lord when we come to the cross that takes away all pride because we're nothing as we stand before the Lord. It keeps us all humble. It keeps us all faithful. And even tonight as we hear about the cross, as we hear it sung about, as we hear it preached about, may the Lord truly thrill the hearts of his people and reach the unsaved when I survey the wondrous cross.
beautiful piece just to introduce the preaching of the glorious gospel of Christ. That message brings us to the very heart of God's gospel of grace, the place called Calvary. And there we survey that wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. And we would count everything but loss that we might win him and be found in Christ. And we would like Paul glory in the cross for the cross is the glory and triumph of every believer and it is the joy of heaven forevermore. And I wonder tonight spiritually, have you been to Calvary? Have you been to the cross? Has there been a time in your life when you look to the sacrifice of Calvary's hill and to the finished work of God's dear lamb? I wonder are you saved tonight? Is it well with your soul? Could be some listening, some tuning in maybe at a later stage. And I wonder, a great question concerning your soul, is it well between you and God? Are you right with God? Do you know your sins forgiven? Do you have peace with God? It can only happen at the place that we just heard sung about, the place called Calvary, and through the cross work of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Once again, we do add to the words of welcome that you have received uh, we really are delighted that there are many who have been tuning in. We've received some emails and text messages and WhatsApp and so on and so on and phone calls as well. And folks have been tuning in, they've been listening and we're thankful to the Lord. He has been blessing his word and we trust tonight that it will be the same and in a greater measure that God will bless the preaching of the old evangel through the airwaves in social media, sermon audio, Facebook and as already been indicated, send the link uh, press the share button and make sure others are introduced to the services and we trust God will bless his word to your heart, encourage you if you're saved and if you're not, that you t might come to know Christ as your own and personal saviour. With just one verse of scripture for you this evening, I invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of Proverbs, the 15th chapter. And we want just to leave the words of verse 24 with you in the gospel. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 24. We read these words in the word of God. The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath beneath. After the grave, there is Gehenna, where the worm doth not, and the fire is never quenched. But the way of life is above. It comes and originates from God. The way to heaven and the way to eternal life is outside a human being. It's invested in Christ, the mediator and substitute and so the way of life is not in yourself or in the church. It is above, comes from heaven, that a sinner might depart from hell beneath. Remember what I said, after the grave, if you're not saved, it's Gehenna, where the worm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. Let's keep our Bibles open, and we'll ask help of God in the ministry and in the hearing of the precious Word of God. Father, we thank thee for these meetings already. We thank thee, Lord, for help that has been given. And since we have asked publicly, we want to return thanks immediately. And like even the one leper out of the ten, to return to give glory to God, to thank thee for past blessing, for being with us. We thank thee for help given in the uh, leading. We thank thee for the Lord blessing there's been in the ministry and song by the congregation and also the choirs. We thank thee, Lord, for the reading of Scripture, uh, the preaching forth of the message for those who are hearing, for unsaved that are tuning in, for those who are requesting, Lord, the booklet and the CD, and for those who are being blessed. And we do give God the glory and give thanks to the Lord. And tonight, Lord, as we would 
finish off on the final weeknight of this online mission. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst be pleased to bless again. Come with a greater measure of thy blessing. Come with an intensified sense of thy divine presence. And remember those who hear the word tonight. Prepare their hearts, we pray. God, grant that you will send forth thy light and thy truth, that they may lead sinners to Christ and to the cross. We pray, O oh God, that there will be the lifting up, the exaltation of the man of Calvary. We pray that Christ would have preeminence and that the Lamb would have all of the glory. So to this end, Father, I ask humbly that thou wouldst remember me. I stand in human weakness and insufficiency. I stand in human inability, and I'm cast upon the mercy and grace and help of God. And I look to thee now by faith and acknowledge my need of thee and pray, Lord, that thou wouldst cleanse my heart and purify my soul. Give to me clean hands and a pure heart. Give to me, O God, the cleansing power of the blood, the value, virtue, vitality, and victory of the precious blood of the Lamb. I now appropriate to my own heart and soul for cleansing and the vessel cleansed by precious blood. God, grant that thou wouldst then fill now with thy Holy Spirit of promise. Our Lord Jesus Christ has said, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Father, I honor thee, and by faith I take the promised Holy Ghost. I take the power of Pentecost to fill me now to the uttermost. I take, but he undertakes for me. And the people of God said, Amen. You know, one of the most sobering realities of the Bible is that it presents to us the fact that there is a hell. After the grave, Gehenna, where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched, hell is a place of future punishment. For those who die in their sin, without Christ, without God, without hope, without salvation, without grace, without righteousness, and without precious blood, and without hope in eternity to come. And the fact that God has a place so foul, so terrible, so horrible, so vile, reserved for all who die without Christ as their own and personal Savior. It has to be the most alarming fact in all of God's created universe. John Blanchard, in a tremendous volume, uh, subjected a book called Whatever Happened to Hell. He had this to say, although he had many more things in that book to say. I quote, Nobody can think seriously about hell and remain emotionally unaffected. The thought, now listen to this, the thought that after a few years upon this earth, an untold number of human beings will be cast away or thrown away as worthless and spend an, an eternity in indescribable agony. It's overwhelming. Unquote. And such is the consideration, the dreadful contemplation that hell is real, a place of everlasting punishment. It has led many individuals to play it down today, to dismiss it and not to think about it. It has led many to attack those who preach it on a regular basis and keep it before society and before the people. It has led many to laugh and mock at it because they're afraid to even think that there would be such a place. And there is, my friend, because if you die without Christ and without the new birth and without God's salvation, then after the grave there is Gehenna, the place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. But Scripture, my friend, is not silent on the doctrine of of everlasting punishment and on the doctrine of hell, then why should we keep silent when God is not silent on the matter? He has revealed to us, He has told us in His Word that in all of His creation, He created hell. And He created hell for the devil and for His angels and the wicked, the sinner. 
The one who dies without Christ and the nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. That's what the Bible teaches. We cannot be any more compassionate than our God. We cannot try to love a sinner more and tell him it doesn't exist. We have got, if we love your soul, to tell you the truth. God does not keep quiet on the subject of hell, and neither should we. And neither should we fail to warn you, as a sinner lost undone, that there is a place called hell, and that sinners who die in their sin will spend eternal days in the most excruciating, terrifying, horrible pain and misery for all eternity. It's referred to in the Bible as unquenchable fire. Think of it, unquenchable fire. Did you know that there was a fire burning upon the earth? In fact, it was down in a mine in China. It was on fire for some 500 years. It was only in recent years they declared that they had quenched that burning fire. For 500 years, down in a coal mine, that fire burned. And for 500 years, they tried to put that fire out. And it was only in recent years that they were able to say, we have finally extinguished one of the longest burning fires in history. And I want to tell you, my friend, the Bible says hell is unquenchable fire. There's no escaping the damnation of hell. There's no escaping its pain and its torment. It is unquenchable fire, the most intense pain that a person could ever experience in their body and their soul for all eternity will be the experience of hell. Furthermore, it's called the blackness of darkness forever. There goes the notion, doesn't it, of that you'll have a party in hell, that all your friends will be gathered and the music will be playing and you'll be able to fulfill all the lusts of your flesh without interference from those fanatics who preach about hell and about how to get to heaven. It's called the blackness of darkness forever. It's not just darkness, but the blackness of darkness. There are no other words in the English language and even in the sacred language Hebrew to describe to us the blackness and darkness of that place. You will see no one. If you want to think about socially distancing in this day, let me tell you something. The social distancing in hell, the blackness of darkness forever, no light. You will see no one and no one will see you. And I want to tell you, my friend, it's the blackness of darkness and you will be on your own. You might hear the screams. You might even hear over your own torments and screams and cries as you curse God and man in hell. The cries of someone else somewhere in the abyss. But you will never see them. It's the blackness of darkness forever. Hell, my friend, is a place where there is continual torment in the darkest, deepest suffering. The Bible says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and forever. So it is a place of horrifying screams and terrible cries. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and forever. A place in which all who enter will never leave. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's a place where the worm of conscience and memory fixed upon occasions 
when you heard the gospel, when you could have been saved, when you were given a gospel tract, when you refused to go to a mission, when you wouldn't tune in perhaps to a meeting like this on previous nights, when you wouldn't give your soul the means of grace, when you wouldn't let anyone witness to you, when you threw away the day of grace and you wasted every opportunity and you knew the truth and you didn't come to Christ, the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. It's an abode where the memory terrorizes the sinner for missed opportunities and failure to accept Christ's free offer in the gospel. It's called in Isaiah, the devouring fire, and listen to it, everlasting burnings, where the sinner is continually under the terrifying judgment of Almighty God, and he's never reformed because hell's not remedial punishment. It's retributive. It's never designed to better a person, to, to rehabilitate a person, to change their thinking and their character, to bring them to face up to their sin and then to repent. It's not like that. That is not the character, nor is it the design of hell. It's not like the prison where men and women and young people are incarcerated today. They have a designation to be remedial in their punishment. That is, they seem and they want to better that person and teach that person the moral lessons and, and moral accountability and responsibility that they might do what's right. But hell is not remedial punishment. Hell is retributive. And therefore, it's a punishment that goes on and on because they have nothing to pay. They have nothing they can give to God because they've rejected the only work and the only offering and the only sacrifice and the only atonement, Christ and His cross. And now there's nothing left for all eternity. There's nothing out there and there's nothing more. And you'll never find it. You'll never have it. You've rejected it. Hell is a place that houses the worst dregs of humanity. Murderers, adulterers, thieves, drunkards, drug abusers, perverts, child molesters. However, listen to it. There'll be good people there. Moral people there. Religious people there. People who prayed. People who read the Bible. People who helped their fellow man. People who helped charitable causes. The people who were church goers, maybe even some who were so-called clergymen or women, perhaps those who held some office in the church as well, maybe even some who worked with children in the church. Why? Why would you group that company with those others, as you said, the dregs of humanity? I'll tell you why. Because they constitute all who have died ungraced without salvation. They've never been born again, never been saved, never been converted, and therefore they constitute the mass of fallen humanity from Adam, who have never got right with God or been saved by sovereign grace. I want to tell you, hell is a place where the unsaved go, where the unforgiven and unconverted, unconverted sinner goes, and they dwell there as their abode for all eternity. It's the region of the wicked dead. It's the invisible world where the souls of Christ's rejectors at death immediately go. Hell's a place so foul, so horrible, so terrible, so vile, so dark, so dreadful, so real, that it has to be the most alarming fact in all of God's created universe. And friend, you need to hear about hell. You need to hear of that place called Gehenna, hell, where the worm dieth not. The fire is never quenched. And you need to flee from wrath to come and escape the judgment and damnation of hell and the eternal ruin and destruction of your immortal soul by coming as a sinner to Christ, by seeking the Lord for mercy, calling upon God for pardon, trusting in the finished work, resting in the shed blood of the Lamb and the great once-for-all offering of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to save your soul tonight by entrusting it to Christ alone so that you might escape the devouring fire 
and everlasting burnings of that place the Bible calls hell. Our text, I believe, will offer some further counsel concerning the subject of hell and will instruct us, I believe, as to how we can escape the dreadful, burning, eternal place the Bible calls hell. Notice, therefore, some things from this text of Scripture. There is, I believe, inferred that sinners are already on the road that leads to hell. Look what it says that he might depart from hell beneath. Do you see it there? That he, the sinner, might depart from hell beneath. I believe the text infers that sinners are already on the road to hell. Elsewhere in Scripture, the word depart that we find here in Proverbs 15 and verse 24, that word depart is translated as to turn aside, to get off that road. That's what it means. Turn aside. Do an about turn and go in a different direction. It means to be taken off that road. It literally means to turn off. When you're driving on a road, you know what it means. And, and someone says, you know, there's a turn off up here and you've got to turn off this road. That's what that word depart actually means. It means to turn aside. It means to be taken off or to turn off or literally to remove yourself from that road. That's literally what that verse is translated elsewhere in Scripture. And here we find it in relation to the road that leads to hell. Sinners are exhorted by God to depart, to leave that path. And the only way a person can leave the path of sin that leads to hell is by repentance, doing an about turn, a complete turnaround in your life concerning your sin. Implied here, I believe, in this text of Scripture is the teaching that the sinner is traveling in a particular direction. He's on a certain road or pathway, and sadly it leads to that place called hell. Mistakenly, there are many tonight, men and women and young people, who think they're on their way to heaven. If you ask some people tonight, and you say to them, well, tell me, if you were to die now, where would your soul be? You know, instantly, because they would like to think this, they would say to you and to me, oh, I would be in heaven. And if you were to search their heart and conscience by questions and say, well, tell me, how do you know that? Uh, well, I, I think I am, and I, and I hope I am. And I just feel that, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with my life, and I, I just feel that's the place where I would be. And mistakenly, there are many who think they're going to heaven, but they're not. They are convinced that they're on the pathway which leads to heaven and home. And yet they've never been born again. They've never acknowledged they were sinners. They've never looked to Christ. They're not trusting in or resting upon the finished work and precious shed blood as the ground of their acceptance with God and peace with God and eternal life. They are convinced that the pathway that they are traversing is the one that leads to heaven when all the time they're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Remember this, the Bible does not teach that we are all going to heaven. It does not teach that. Now, all might want to be in heaven. All might like to think they would be in heaven. But I want to tell you, because of Adam's sin in the garden, he plunged all mankind into a state of sin and misery. All who are born of Adam's sinful, procreated line are born sinners with their backs toward heaven and their faces toward hell. We inherited the sinful nature of our first parents. We are born in sin, David said in Psalm 51, and shapen in iniquity. We're born sinners. We're not born Christians. 
We're born naturally sinful and estranged and alienated from God. And we're naturally born into this world as guilty sinners because of Adam's sin. And we share in the guilt of that sin. And then we are sinners by actual sin. We transgress naturally and repel every offer of God's mercy and love and grace in Christ. We turn our backs naturally. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And the Bible concludes all under the guilt of sin. Paul's epistle to the church and to believers at Rome uh, tell us that there's the universal guilt of sin upon all mankind, for there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Sin has corrupted the whole from the head down to the very feet. We are unacceptable to God, unapproachable to God. We, we become filthy, and sin corrupts the entire being. Your iniquities separate between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear, Isaiah tells us. And as sinners were under the terrible condemnation of God's holy law. The wages of sin is death. Death physical, it's already occurring in your body. You're dying as I speak. It's already occurred spiritually from you were born and from Adam. We were born cut off from God and we're dead in sins and trespasses. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. I want to tell you, my friend, there will be eternal death. It's called hell, Gehenna, the place where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. Sin, when it is finished, when it's run its course in a sinner's life, bringeth forth happiness, no. Bringeth forth eternal life, no. Bringeth forth death and eternal death at that. It is Christ alone who can deliver us from the condemnation of our sin. He came from heaven above. He came down to this world. He is the creator of the world. He is Elohim of Genesis. He's the Jehovah of Exodus. He is the El Shaddai of Abraham. He is the Adonai, the Lord and sovereign master of the universe. And he is Jesus, the Savior. He is the second person of the triune God. God, the Son and Son of God, who became by virgin birth the Son of Man. And he was made bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, all for the sufferings of death at the place called Calvary. There he laid down his life, a ransom price for sin. He suffered on the cross when he took sin's punishment, your sin and mine, upon his own sinless body at Calvary. There on the tree, Christ bore the eternal punishment. He endured our hell, our sorrow, our torment, our anguish, our affliction, our pain, our misery, our sin. And all of its condemnation and all of its eternal consequences were keenly, literally, truly, really felt upon the body of God's dear Son when He stood, stood as our substitute, when He took the sinner's place and offered to God a perfect sacrifice to satisfy divine justice, to turn away divine wrath, and in the shedding of His blood to extinguish the guilt of your sin and mine if we come in repentance and faith to Him. He died on the cross, thus bearing the just penalty. The wages of sin is death. Christ died for us. I want to tell you, death itself for the sinner without Christ is hell. But a death in Christ is heaven. It's only when you die with your faith and your trust in Christ alone for salvation can you reach heaven. Now let me say to every single sinner listening to this gospel message right now, if you have never been born again of God's Holy Spirit, if you have never had your sins forgiven and washed and cleansed and pardoned on the ground of the shed blood of God's Lamb, if you have never repented, truly been sorry for your sin, faced up to your sin, acknowledged your offense before a holy God, and if you've never personally received Christ by faith into your heart and life as your own and personal Savior, then you are not on the road to heaven. Rather, you're headed for eternal destruction in hell. And there's no easy way to tell you that truth. It's unpalatable, I know. And it's not popular today, I know. And you'll never get the plaudits of men. And we never should be seeking that. And you'll never be 
popular and you'll never get a pat on the back for preaching like this, but that doesn't matter when you realize just how real hell is. And true love does not hide the truth or tell you a lie. It tells you the truth even if you choose not to be our friend. Your sin, my friend, if it's not dealt with, is an offense to a holy God, and God will punish that sin on your body and soul in hell. If it hasn't been pardoned and washed and cleansed and forgiven by the work of Christ on the cross, then my friend, your sin will take you to a lost eternity. And every day that you live as an unconverted, unforgiven sinner, you're walking the highway that leads to a lost eternity. You're traveling on the road of Christ to a Christless hell, my friend, and you're on the pathway that leads to everlasting destruction. And unless, as is implied in the text, you depart from hell beneath, you turn aside from off the road you're traveling, unless you remove your feet from the pathways of sin, you will fall, you will slide, and you will drop into the place the Bible calls hell, hell beneath. For in the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden, sin placed you on the road to hell, my friend. God didn't put you there. Sin did your sin. And my friend, I want to tell you, every day you live without Christ and without God and without salvation, listen to me, you're taking a step closer to the place the Bible calls hell beneath. Unconverted man, woman, young person, boy or girl, the text implies, doesn't it, that you're already on the road that leads to hell and you need to depart from it. Your wisdom is to recognize your sin that's leading to hell beneath. And only in Christ can your sin be dealt with. Only Christ can save you and deliver you and redeem your soul from hell. But you've got to come and trust Him. Because if you die in your sin after the grave, it's Gehenna, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So the text in plays that men and women are already on the road that leads to hell. But secondly, the text instructs us to the way of escape from hell beneath. Notice what it says in the opening part of the text. The way of life is above to the wise. The way of life is above. Do you see that? The way of life is inside a man. It's not there. The way of life is invested in the church. It's not there. The way of life is found in the sacrament of communion. It's not there, friend. The way of life is through the waters of baptism. It doesn't say that, friend. The way of life is being confirmed. It does not say that. You're making it up. You're believing a lie. You're calling God a liar. You're disbelieving His Word. The way of life is not in a church. It's not in a system. It's not in a creed. It's not in a rite or a ritual. It's not in you, and it's not in a priest, and it's not in the Pope, and it's not in a prelate, and it's not in a pastor or a preacher. The way of life is from above. In other words, the way in which a sinner enters into life is to be found above. It originates in God who sent Christ from above down into this world as a true man born of a virgin. God entered into our humanity. I want you to think about that great truth. That's the teaching of Scripture. God the Son, the one who is Elohim and Jehovah, the creator of all things, entered in to the womb of a virgin, and God became a human being. God, the Creator, 
was made bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. He was born as a babe in Bethlehem. He's the Christ child. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of God's elect. And that child grew through all the facets of human life. And he felt every pain and human woe, for he's a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with our grief. I want to tell you, my friend, that God from above sent his darling of his bosom, his only begotten, his well-beloved son. And he gave him up to untold sorrow and suffering at the hands of cruel and wicked men. And after man had done their worst to the body of God's dear son, lifted up was he to die. And on the cross, I like to think of it like this, on the cross, he had God, holy, just, and true, and righteous in one hand, and sinful, fallen humanity in the other hand. And he reconciled through his own body a holy God to sinful, fallen man, that they might be in an everlasting union by faith in Christ's finished work at Calvary. Salvation comes from above. It's not what the Lord Jesus told a very devout religious man one day who wasn't going to heaven, by the way. And he said to that man, except a man be born again. And the word literally means except a man be born from above. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Sinner, you do not need to look to the church tonight. You do not look to, need to look to an institution tonight. No matter what that institution is, no matter what color it represents, no matter what church you attend or what denomination you belong to, if one or another or if none at all, you do not need to look to yourself and your good works tonight. You do not, not need to look to the free church or to this preacher. You need to look to Christ. The way of life is above you. The way of life is beyond you in the sense you cannot save yourself and you cannot give yourself eternal life, nor can you merit favor with God by any of your works for their filthy rags. And it's not of works lest any man should boast. By grace are you saved through faith. Christ alone can save you. What's your hope for heaven tonight? Tell me, what are you resting your head on the pillow tonight? If you were not to wake up and never see the morning and through the night God calls your soul into eternity. I'm not talking about whether it's goose-filled or duck-filled uh, pillow. I'm talking spiritually, metaphorically. What are you resting the, the, the head of your soul upon? As you go to sleep tonight, as you put your head upon a physical pillow, I'm asking you the question, what's your soul leaning on? What's your soul resting in? Good works, false hope, your church, your baptism, all these other things beside, unless it's Christ alone, you'll never be in heaven. Oh, but I believe in Christ and I read my Bible. Oh, so you're saying it's Christ and reading your Bible. Oh, but I believe in Christ and I go to church and say my prayers. So you're adding to God's salvation. It's Christ alone without any other thing, just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, just as I am. I bring nothing with me, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I wonder tonight, have you looked unto him and been saved? I tell you, it was Christ who came from above, leaving the glory and splendor of heaven. He tabernacled as a man, amongst men. And he died an atoning death at Calvary and gave his life a ransom price for sin. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The way of life is Christ. The way to life is by looking to him and to him alone. The way of life is above to the wise. Don't be a fool. Be wise tonight and come to Christ as a sinner. I want to tell you in the work that Christ finished and accomplished, accomplished on Calvary's tree for our sins and rising again for our justification, 
in the offices that he now fulfills as our, our priest and our substitute and our Savior, and the everlasting righteousness he gives to those who believe in him, and that perpetual intercession uh, that he makes for sinners at the Father's right hand, and the precious blood that he shed to wash away our sin, and the power that he exercises by his Holy Spirit, and the convicting and converting of a sinner, and his willingness now to receive pardon and forgive and save all who will repent and believe the gospel, and in his readiness now to save the vilest offender who truly believes we have God's remedy for our sin, God's way of escape from the lowest hell. And if you come to Christ tonight, my friend, renouncing all other hopes of salvation and looking above where Christ is at the right hand of the Father, a prince and a saviour, a redeemer for those who will come by faith to him, I want to tell you he will save you from hell beneath. And so implied in our text is that all mankind is already on the road to hell. And I want to tell you as well that the text instructs us that the way of life to depart from hell beneath is above. It's found in a person, God's dear Son. But finally, I want you to think that the text issues a call to decision. It implies, it instructs, but the text issues a call to decision. Look what it says there. Underline it. Underscore it. It's emphasized here for you. Life above hell beneath. The text brings you, my friend, tonight to make a decision, a choice for all eternity. Life above Christ, hell beneath without Christ. I believe it brings you to the crossroads. The Lord sets before you, sinner, in the closing moments of this gospel meeting, life above, hell beneath. Which will it be, sinner? How will you die? As the tree falleth, so shall it lie. If it falls to the south, it lies and it rots to the south. If it falls to the north or the east or the west, it lies there and it rots north, east, south or west. And I want to tell you, friend, as a man or a woman and a young person dies at death, that's your eternal condition. That's your eternal state. And it can never be changed. It'll be life above. Christ for me, or hell beneath. Which will it be, friend, at death or at Christ's coming? Saved or lost? Heaven or hell? Glory or despair? Which will it be, friend, life above? Hell beneath. You see, friend, we can't save you. We cannot coerce you. We will not seek in any way to railroad you into a decision. We will seek with gospel love and persuasion and appeal to conscience and logic and apply the word by the power of the Holy Spirit to your conscience and to your heart and pray that God will convict you of your sin. But friend, ultimately, the decision is with you. The responsibility is with you. You are obligated to prepare your own soul and to make sure that your soul is fitted for heaven and home and life above and departs from hell beneath. I want to tell you, Pilate asked a very important question. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Friend, what are you going to do with Christ tonight? What are you going to do with his salvation? What are you going to do with the precious blood? What are you going to do with the finished work? What are you going to do with the commands of the gospel to repent of your sin and to believe the gospel? What are you going to do with the invitations and calls of Christ in the gospel? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What are you going to do when the Spirit draws near and is striving with your soul and is convicting you of your sin and showing your need of a Savior? What are you going to do, my friend, now as Christ draws near in love and mercy to your soul as his arms are open wide and he invites you and calls you and commands you come to me and I will save you life's above hell's beneath now what are you going to do with God's dear son 
Uh, someday Christ may be asking what he will do with you. Uh, the hymn writer penned these words, Jesus, for your choice is waiting. Tarry not at once decide. While the Spirit now is striving, yield and seek the Savior's side. Friend, come to Christ tonight. Trust the Savior, will you? You need to do it now. Uh, you need to come. Uh, have done with indecision. You need to stop procrastinating. If you know you need to be saved and you know that hell's beneath you and you're on the road to a lost eternity, why tarry? Why wait? Why put it off? There's no reason in that. There's no logic in that. That's foolishness. You see, life above is to the wise, the text says. And hell beneath is to the foolish individual. Don't be a fool, friend. But come to Christ while there is time and opportunity. Don't neglect the so great salvation that's offered freely now to you. But come and grasp it. Take it now. Receive it in Christ into your heart as your Savior. Turn from your sin. Or yield to his offer of mercy. O oh, take of the grace he imparts. And don't, friend, don't go away without Jesus in your heart. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. May God bless his word to your heart and bring you savingly to Christ this night. If you need help, if you would like to know something more about how you, a sinner, can be saved and how you can be sure of heaven, then please don't hesitate to speak to somebody. If you cannot get speaking to us, if you feel uncomfortable with a stranger, and seek out somebody you know who's a believer, someone who's well saved, and well able to point you to Christ, the only Savior. If you have any concern or anxiety, we haven't put that there. The Holy Ghost is striving. He's calling. If you have any concern, any sense of wrongdoing and guilt, that's the Spirit working. That's the Spirit convincing. The Holy Ghost is at work. That's the time to come, friend. Strike when the iron's hot, lest you grow cold and hard and turn your back forever on God and depart not from hell beneath, but depart from the path that would lead you to heaven and home and drop into a Christless hell. Don't go away without Jesus in your heart. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we humbly pray now for thy blessing to rest upon the preached word. We acknowledge, Lord, thy presence and help that's been given. And we're praying solemnly and humbly for a gracious work of thy spirit. We pray that this meeting and this mission will yield fruit for God's glory in eternity. We pray that sinners would be converted, backsliders restored, the people of God edified, built up in their most holy faith, and above all, Christ honored and glorified. Receive of our thanks and bless the preaching of thy word. We ask these things humbly, with thanksgiving believing, in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. Thank you for listening, and may God richly bless you and your family and bring you, if you're not saved, to know Christ as your Savior. Thank you.